Hello, a very warm welcome to Middle East Matters. I'm Sanam Shanti. Coming up on this week's program, Iran's lawmakers call for reforms. This following news of an 11-year-old girl who was married off to a man above the age of 40, reportedly to pay off her father's debts. This week's guest is Arab-American artist Helen Zoraib. Uh, she's joining us from Washington, D.C. to talk about her latest collection. That's the Syrian Migration Series. Also coming up, animated TV series Flavors of Iraq by Furat Alani. In this episode, our protagonist meets a French football fan in the town of Ramadi near the desert. Thank you for watching Middle East Matters. We start this week's program with a first for Saudi Arabia. The ultra-conservative kingdom has appointed its first woman to serve as ambassador to the United States. Princess Rima bin Bandar al Saud is the daughter of a former longtime Saudi ambassador to the country. She's taking on the post amid allegations of torture of women's rights activists in the country, as well as increasing pressure from US lawmakers and the international community over the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. To Iran now, where there are renewed concerns surrounding child marriage. An 11-year-old girl from the city of Lam was married off to a man reportedly around four times her age. He's certainly above the age of 40. Now, she's currently in the care of the state. Here's a report uh, from our correspondent on the ground, Ali Bashar. It's a marriage that caused a scandal in Iran and incited lawmakers to push for reforms. A wedding between an 11-year-old girl and a man more than four times her age. The girl's father reportedly sold her hand in marriage to pay off his debts. That is not a marriage. It's the sale of a child. And it's happening because of poverty and unemployment. Otherwise, no family would be willing to sell their daughters. A local court ordered the child be placed in the care of the state welfare organization. And authorities have pressed charges against the young girl's father and her new husband, who has seven children himself. The marriage did not receive the legally required court approval. The judge ruled that the child was neither physically nor psychologically ready. Her father and her husband will both be punished. Families can sidestep the minimum marriage age of 13 by obtaining legal approval for the union. Last December, a parliamentary committee rejected a bill that would have altogether banned unions with girls under the age of 13. The Constitutional Committee rejected the proposal because it violates the teachings of Islam. The law can be amended for exceptional cases like the one in question, but it cannot prevent those under the age of 18 from getting married. According to UNICEF, at least 17 percent of girls in Iran are married before they turn 18 and 3% of them are under 15. But many say these statistics are likely much higher, as many families in Iran do not register births or underage marriages. Now to an announcement that has sent reverberations through the Middle East. The UK has banned support for Hezbollah's political wing. That's according to the Home Secretary, who has accused the Lebanese Islamist group of destabilizing the region. The decision comes as the US piles pressure on Hezbollah, placing several sets of sanctions on the group and its regional backer, Iran. Now to Helen Zoghaib, one of the most renowned Arab-American artists of our time. She's uh, joining us from Washington, D.C. today to talk about her latest collection, the Syrian Migration Series, which is on display in the city's Gallery Al-Quds until February 28th. Helen herself had to flee her homeland, Lebanon, several times uh, due to conflict. Today, her paintings are hung across the globe, including at the White House and the World Bank. Helen, thanks so much uh, for being with us here on Middle East Matters. Tell us, just how much has your own experience, your displacement from Lebanon following the civil conflict, influenced uh, your artwork? Well, I think what, it, what it's made me is very empathetic towards people fleeing their homes when they don't want to leave. Um, they leave everything behind. We left everything, including my father, and we went to... Um, ultimately to France, actually, and he joined us there. But you leave everything. You leave your memories, you leave your friends, you leave your home. 
and your family, and it's, it's very difficult. And I think it's come into my work in a couple of different ways. Um, looking back with nostalgia, longing, where do you fit in, in your new country, in Lebanon? It has affected me a lot, actually. So you've had your own experience, and of course your current collection, the Syrian Migration Series, was very much influenced by Jacob Lawrence's work, which depicts the Great Migration in the mid-1900s. Did you do that to make your message more relatable in a way? Well, that's a great question. I, um, I think it's, it's actually two parts, because being in America, um, I do want to have the message across to get to the Western audience from an Arab perspective. And so it's important to me that my work does relate to, if you want to say, the Western eye or the Western ear or the Western heart, actually. Um, and beyond that, the migration series um, had so much in common with what's going on in Syria and also in other conflict areas and people leaving um, for safety and to um, find shelter and the things that every human being um, wants and needs to live a good life. Um, so they left for segregation reasons, not war, but they were trying to find a better life. And I think that's the same with the, the Syrian refugee crisis as well. Now, you just mentioned the Arab perspective. And of course, you're based mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C., the heart of U.S. politics. Your work is currently being shown right. in the city's Gallery Al Quds. Has your work, or you as an artist, have you been received differently or received different treatment where you are? Because there has been a palpable shift in America's policy towards the region, the Arab world. Yes, I mean, there is a strong sentiment of anti-immigration um, that uh, people are facing. I think here, I think in Europe as well, um, a little bit more um, conservative leaning and not as welcoming to um, other people trying to come in, which is difficult. And so I think we do face that. I am here. I listen to the news all the time. I, I see a lot of and participate in demonstrations and a lot of artist uh, sort of activism towards um, getting the idea across that immigrants and people um, are just seeking safety and shelter. They're not um, seeking anything more than that. So it, it, it's, a, it's a strange place to live, actually, but it, um, I think also my voice gets heard here as well. And what's interesting is that uh, often we associate this world that you just mentioned, uh, the refugee, the mm. migration crisis, with slightly darker, less vibrant colors. It's a world associated with a great deal of pain and difficulties. But in your series, in your current series, you've opted for a very uh, bright palette. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that is how I work in general. And my concept is actually, if I create a painting that's beautiful and wants um, has the effect that you want to look at it, that the viewer wants to actually look at my painting because it's a beautiful painting and it's got bright colors and patterns and something that's attracting you. Um, only after you actually look at my painting can you hear what my message is. And I feel that <clears throat> if I get you there, I can share my story with you or share um, the story of the Syrian situation and create an empathy with the viewer so you could actually hear and see what I'm trying to tell you, um, as opposed to creating something very depressing, very horrible to look at. We, it's hard for, for people to relate to that. So I bring it to a different level in hopes of getting you closer so you can actually hear what I have to say. We can call it art uh, with a message, perhaps. Alain Zouraib, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thank you so much okay. uh, for being with Thank us. Thank you. Now, if you happen to be in Washington, uh, D.C., Helen's exhibition at uh, Gallery Al Quds is running until February 28th. We finish Middle East Matters with an episode of animation series Flavors of Iraq written by Franco-Iraqi journalist Furat Alani. This week, our protagonist Furat meets his cousin Odai in the city of Ramadi in the middle of the desert. And Odai happens to be a huge fan of France's football team. 
In 1994, my parents, my sister and I spent the entire summer in Iraq. After Fallujah, we headed to Ramadi to visit my aunt and cousins. The city center was crowded, the houses were impressive, and all around us, the desert. What struck me most in this city in the middle of nowhere was my cousin Odai's t-shirt. I didn't know a bigger fan of France's national football team. For instance, if I gave him the date of a game in 1960, he'd be able to tell me who scored and at exactly what time. When I'd visit, Odai would always ask me to bring him French football magazines and Panini stickers, both unheard of in these parts. His all-consuming passion began in 1982 during a holiday with us in France. Odai fell in love with the nation of his favorite player, Platini. Odai was my mirror image. I was a young Frenchman spellbound by Iraq. He was a young Iraqi spellbound by France. In 2005, the course of his life changed. An American convoy came under attack. Odai needed to avoid stray bullets, seek shelter from another explosion, quickly. But also, not get mistaken for an insurgent. The next day, like some four million Iraqis displaced by war, Odai fled the country, leaving everything behind, including his most treasured possession, his collection of French football team stickers. Well, that's it for us this week. Thank you for watching Middle East Matters.